So why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and what type of uh, freelance work that you do. Uh, my name is Bob Dreyfus. Um, I live in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, I've been a freelance journalist in the Washington area for about 12 or 13 years and I write for um, really four or five regular magazines and then some others. Um, I'm uh, a contributing editor or writer at uh, Mother Jones and The Nation, The American Prospect, and also I write a lot for Rolling Stone. Those are my sort of my basic magazines and I, I really cover everything. I've been doing Washington politics and features and profiles for all that time. Um, but actually for the last two years I've been focusing pretty heavily on Iraq and the Middle East since it became the main story of the day. So I've done a number of investigative reports on um, the run up to the war and the whole sort of post-war quagmire and, and who's to blame and how we got there. And, and so when you look at some of the investigative reports that you've done, uh, can you, you know, were you doing a lot of stuff that other people weren't looking at? Uh, did, just speak kind of in general terms, you know, where you saw holes and why you decided to... You know, I, I think I did. I mean, I, I could point to several different things. I did, back in the, let's see, back okay, well, in... I'm, I'm also going to be uh, eliminating my answer, my question. Oh, yeah, whatever, sure, don't, don't so worry about if, it. Uh, if, uh, if you have a pronoun or something that's not, doesn't stand on its own, I may ask you... Right. To... Okay, that's fine. No problem. No problem. Um, Back in the fall of 2002, I did probably the first extensive profile of Ahmed Shalabi, the head of the Iraqi National Congress. Yeah, because I think that got picked up. The door is done, but... Okay, yeah, Back in 2002, in the fall, I did really, I think, the first extensive profile of Ahmed Shalabi, the head of the Iraqi National Congress. Um, and I had really, I guess, was surprised that no one had really dug into Shalabi's past before. Um, partly I just started by doing a nexus search and all this amazing stuff turned up about his conviction in Jordan and his general record as a charlatan. And at the time, uh, not many people were looking at, at him, although he had been a key figure in Washington for uh, at least a decade. Uh, organizing with the neoconservatives on behalf of various movements and resolutions and even the Iraq Liberation Act in the 1990s that funded the Iraqi National Congress, among other uh, groups. And so what happened is I, I did an extensive profile of him and documented some of his connections to uh, Richard Pearl and to um, some of the early uh, pioneers of the neoconservative worldview like Albert uh, Wolstetter and others and I found that that, re that article got a tremendous reaction although um, it, I never saw a subsequent article until probably a year later that was as detailed as that. Um, exactly why I can't say. I think to a large degree there were a lot of people who relied on Shalabi for information because he was providing people in the press as well as the intelligence agencies with a huge amount of material. And so nobody wanted to directly attack him because he'd cut them off, which is of course exactly what happened to me. They wouldn't talk to me after my story came out. Um, and not only that, but he had a lot of friends among the people uh, who were the organizers of the war, not just outside the administration, the think tanks and so forth, but also the people inside the administration, the neoconservatives who were sprinkled through um, 15 or 20 different positions in the Defense Department and other agencies. And so um, I think that's one thing I could point to in terms of you know something that people weren't looking at, amazingly so. And people were treating Shalabi with a lot of respect and I found as I started calling around and talking to people that people were laughing at him and calling him a clown and a buffoon and a liar. And these were not, you know, I'm not talking about left-wing sources. I'm talking about CIA people and ambassadors and people who were, you know, in senior positions or had been in the past. And so that made me think that there's more to this story than, you know, just um, a, a wayward exile trying to organize his return to his homeland. And when you look after the war, there seemed to be, you know, this turning point when Charlie is, you know, his house is raided and 
and, and it, you know, a few weeks later, the New York Times finally has their, their mea culpa after their, their source is kind of officially discredited. Uh, and when you look back at the article, it seems to be very prophetic in a way. So can you speak to, you know, just kind of encapsulate that change, and then after that point, it seems like people were catching up in a way. Well, at the beginning, Shalabi was seen as kind of a, a hero and a hero and and. and let me start again. At the beginning, Shalabi was seen as kind of a hero and the leader of a noble cause. And nobody wanted to attack him because he was playing such a central role in the run-up to the war. Um, gradually, there began to creep in you know, some naysayers, partly because a lot of the American national security establishment was attacking him so strongly. And what really did him in is when he finally got back to Baghdad in the spring of 2003, it turned out he had exactly zero support, that he had no uh, supporters, no followers, no organization, no credibility among Iraqis. And so that, combined with the fact that um, all of his information was wrong, that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, that there were no ties to terrorism that were uncovered, um, and, and especially that we weren't welcomed with open arms, I, I like to say just arms, but not open arms. <coughs> As a result of all this, Shalabi lost all of his credibility. Um, and he started quickly falling um, you know, in, in the esteem of even the Pentagon because he couldn't deliver. Um, and it kind of culminated in this uh, almost farcical um, controversy over him blabbing to the Iranian intelligence office in, in Baghdad and telling him uh, American secrets, which, which is really what eventually tripped him up. And we look in the context of the New York Times, um, evaluating, can you kind of like evaluate the New York Times coverage before the war, you know, Chalabi's influence, and then like how Chalabi was a trigger point in a way? Mm -hmm. Well, I think Chalabi was kind of a Pied Piper for most of the media. The New York Times, of course, leads the way, and some of its writers, Judy Miller, of course, and many others, uh, were constantly going to the Shalabi well and not realizing it was a poisoned one, and were getting information and secrets and defectors and people like that to talk to. And it all turned out to be uh, bogus information, but it was so good, it was so exciting, that they just went with it. And I, you know, I wonder about Judy Miller. I mean, she is, I think, has an ideological uh, edge to her writing, too. She co-authored a book with Laurie Milroy a few years ago. Laurie Milroy is an almost deranged advocate of uh, attacking Iraq. She blames Iraq for the Oklahoma City bombing um, that Tim McVeigh was executed for. And of course, he had no Iraqi connections, but she still, to this day, says that he did and that Iraq was behind the bombing in Oklahoma City. So, I mean, she is a conspiracy theorist nut. And for her to have authored a book with Lori, uh, with Lori Milroy to have authored a book with, with Judy Miller makes me wonder, um, you know, about her predilection for listening to somebody like Shalabi, who had this ax to grind against Saddam from the beginning. And uh, wasn't Judy Miller also a member of the Benador Associates, which was kind of like... Yeah, she was. Uh, Eliana Benador um, promoted um, Judy Miller's work, I think not anymore, but in the early 90s, she was one of their list. And the Benador group is basically the, the public relations shop for the whole neoconservative movement. And everybody from Michael Ledeen to Richard Pearl to James Woolsey is on her list. Um, so again, for her to be associated with them and Lori Milroy and Benador and so forth indicates to me that she had um, some uh, ideological uh, predilection for supporting um, and entertaining the views of Shalabi and, and his crew of, of liars and phonies. And when you were in uh, Baltimore, you were speaking in, in terms of uh, looking at the New York Times, Washington Post, that if you read it carefully, that you can still figure out everything that's going on. Can you speak to that, and does that also still hold up during the build-up to the war? You know, I think that if you look at the major newspapers in the United States, most of the information is there. Um, sometimes it's buried in the 19th paragraph. Sometimes it's a small article in an inside page. Uh, and certainly it doesn't penetrate into the consciousness of most people except for 
people who read it very carefully. And then, of course, if you live in the hinterlands and you're reading the St. Louis Post-Dispatch or the Albuquerque paper or the, the Boise, Idaho paper, um, you're only getting the, the skimmed off the surface news, um, you know, on page two of your paper. And so most Americans don't really get an accurate picture of what was happening in Iraq, although if you're following things carefully, you can get a lot from the New York Times. It's, a, it's an amazingly good newspaper. Uh, it throws everything in the kitchen sink into its coverage, but you have to read it pretty carefully to get the information some of the times. So even uh, during the buildup to the war, do you feel that, they, that the performance of the New York Times was adequate? Well, I don't know about adequate. I, if I were the editor of the New York Times, I would have done things radically differently. Um, so no, I mean, I'm not a supporter of the way the New York Times or other newspapers covered the run-up to the war. They should have been far more skeptical um, about the claims of weapons of mass destruction, of all the charges that the Bush administration was making against Iraq, even some of the basic ones, you know, the stuff that Bush said that he gassed his own people and he's killed 300,000 Iraqis. I mean, these charges all came from Iraqi exiles. Um, I think there's an element of truth to almost all of them, even the weapons of mass destruction issue, but they're also wildly exaggerated and inflated that there was no skepticism on the part of the media. Now, the media was reflecting the fact that the politicians didn't exactly clamor to raise objections about these things either, from the far right wing of the, the Republican Party all the way through the Democratic Party, almost to the far left, there was unanimity that Saddam was an evil mastermind of terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. Um, we now know that's pretty much nonsense. But um, there was a consensus view in the political establishment that then got in turn reflected in the media. I don't think the media ought to be reflecting the consensus. I think the media ought to be trying to disrupt and tear apart the consensus if the evidence goes in that direction. New York Times did not do it. In fact, they apologized in the editorial after the war, saying we should have been more skeptical. Of course, that came after several big commissions started to tear apart all of the arguments and, and throw them in the wastebasket, too. So um, the media is coming to its apologies kind of late, I think. And when you say... Uh you know, it's exaggerated to say that he gassed his own people. Didn't hasn't that been established that Halajba did occur? And, and what do you mean by that exactly? Well, I don't know. I haven't been there to investigate. There's there are several people from CIA and Army intelligence who said that at least some, if not all, of the gassing that was done up in the Kurdish areas were was done by Iran. Second, um, there's a question about the numbers. In other words, you see from the Kurds and others figures that. 10, 20, 30,000 people died in those attacks. Um, I think the actual number is far, far less. Maybe it was 1,000 or 2,000 people. I don't know. I've seen a lot of conflicting information. But I don't necessarily take what either the Iraqi exiles or the U.S. government says at face value until we really investigate that. So I think there's questions about um, all of those issues concerning Iraq. And most of them are just sort of assumed like they came, you know, in, in biblical verse uh, without um, anybody digging into it. There's a guy named Stephen Pelletier who's written about the Halabja case who said that the gas that was used there was a gas that Iran had and not Iraq. And he wrote a report about that for Army Intelligence back in the, I think, around 1990. Um, all of this stuff kind of gets discarded and... The, the rush to demonize Saddam was so intense that everything that could be said bad about the guy was just, you know, funneled up the pipeline into the speechwriters at the White House. And all of the stuff that might have uh, been exculpatory or might have uh, disparaged some of his accusers was just thrown in the, in the trash. And I think that's uh, the media's fault above all because a lot of this information was available. And when I look at the you know, State Department's uh, report on uh, human rights that's put each year, and I trace back the dossier, and all the footnotes go to these documents, and most information is actually coming from the UN and uh, non government organizations. Uh, I mean, very little of the, these human rights violations are actually being directly reported by the government, they're being sourced from. Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the U.S. and Special 
the UN Special Rapporteur uh, for Human Rights. Well, there's no question that Saddam. Uh, oh, these are bells. <laughs> To bet it's not one o'clock, you get. There's no question that Saddam Hussein was a significant. Okay. There's no question that Saddam Hussein was a significant violator of human rights, but he was a significant violator of human rights in the 1970s when he was considered to be a Soviet pawn. He was in the 1980s when he was supported by the United States during the Iran-Iraq War, and he was in the 1990s when he was again being demonized by the United States. So our policy towards Saddam Hussein changed for geostrategic reasons and not because of Saddam's actions. I think he was consistent and we weren't. Now, in terms of the sources of all of this stuff, I don't know where these human rights groups got their information. I think a lot of their information, from what I know, came from defectors. It came from people who fled Iraq. It came from people who were released from prison and came and told their stories. And I, I think there's a, a strong probability that many of the human rights groups themselves were influenced by the same people who influenced U.S. intelligence agencies, who were trying to build an outcry against Saddam and who were prone to exaggerate or inflate their claims and their stories. I, I think uh, Kanan Makia's book, which is a, one of the Bibles of the anti-Saddam crusaders, uh, Republic of Fear, is filled with that kind of stuff. He, he threw in there every possible wild accusation coming from defectors and people who'd been in prison. Um, and, and none of it, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is believable because Kanan Makia was one of Ahmed Chalabi's partners in the Iraqi National Congress. Uh, yet he's now revered by a lot of people as a human rights crusader. Um, he's now busily over in Baghdad putting together blackmail dossiers. He got all of the Saddam intelligence agency documents and has squirreled them away in his own little documentation foundation outside the purview of either the occupation authorities or the Iraqi government. And I don't know what's happening to those documents, but they're invaluable for blackmail because their intelligence files. And so he can use those against his and Shalabi's political enemies, and he can destroy documents that might incriminate Shalabi or his allies, um, and no one's going to be the wiser. So, I, I mean, the way information is used and the way Saddam was demonized first in the first Gulf War as a monster when just a few years before he was our ally and then again demonized in the run-up to the, the last Gulf War is, is ridiculous. I mean, the, we now know that Al-Qaeda had far closer ties to Iran and Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, all three of those countries, than it did to Iraq, where Saddam exterminated uh, Islamic fundamentalists and certainly prevented uh, Al-Qaeda from getting a foothold. So the attack on Iraq was completely misdirected and based on lies and distortions and a demonization of Saddam Hussein. If you take a step back and look at principles of journalism, it seems like a principle is you, know, you should independently verify as much information as you can before you report it. And can you speak to that and how the press did in terms of weapons of mass destruction and human rights? Well, I mean, it's hard to talk about how the press did in relationship to this because there's, it's a mixed picture and some people did better than others and some people, you know, did better on one day and terrible on another day. So I don't know if I can generalize too much. Um, I would say that I think the press catastrophically missed the story. In other words, um, it never collectively created the impression among the American people that either, one, Saddam had nothing to do with 9-11. That's now almost a, 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 an act of uh, faith among Americans that Saddam was somehow responsible for 9-11, even today, even despite all the investigations. Yet there was no evidence for that, and the press didn't really forcefully try to debunk that. Second, in terms of the weapons of mass destruction, there were lots of people available before the war 
who were willing to say, and I'm talking about experts, who were willing to say that uh, the UN was right, that many of these weapons were probably destroyed uh, many years ago, um, and that we should let the UN inspections continue. That was, that was a, a theme that has been submerged now as if there were no people saying that. But those people were denied the opportunity to get front page hearing for the most part, um, with the exception of you know, people speaking in a foreign accent, with the exception of you know, officials from various countries in Europe or the Arab world or the United Nations who, who Americans immediately turn off. Um, that's especially true on, on television, where um, Americans tended to lump anybody with a you know, black mustache into the Osama bin Laden category. And so all the Arabs, whether it was the king of Saudi Arabia or Saddam, had to have been al-Qaeda supporters, which is patently ridiculous. Um, even today, people think that somehow the, the Saudi royal family is behind al-Qaeda, even though Al-Qaeda is constantly trying to blow up the Saudi royal family. So I, I, don't, I don't know how, I, I can't excuse the way the media treated this whole weapons of mass destruction and terrorism issue. It's a shameful episode. Um, yes, there are many heroes. I mean, what we know about it, we mostly learn through the media. Um, but for the most part, the impression that was created among the public um, today most of the public believes that we found weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Most of the public believes that Saddam had ties to Al-Qaeda. So there's no way they could get that impression from just watching Fox News. Almost nobody watches Fox News. It's a few hundred thousand people or maybe a million or two on a good day. But among the hundreds of millions of people who watch TV and read newspapers, a wrong impression has been created. Um, and they didn't get it from watching George Bush speeches either, because nobody watches those. They got it from the media. And uh, so, when you take a step back and uh, if you look, you know, how how is the media supposed to prove a negative? Like there are no connections uh, with Al Qaeda, or do, are they merely to say uh, the Bush administration has provided no evidence? They're just insinuating. Well. I wrote about the Iraq Al Qaeda connection uh, in my stories at the end of 2002. And I found lots of officials who were willing to say to me, even on the record, um, that there was no connection. I mean, this was not a, a mysterious issue. There were people who'd studied this for years, who'd spent their lives studying Osama bin Laden, who'd spent their lives studying terrorism, uh, people following Iraq. And I talked to them, and they said, this is nonsense. Now, I don't know what, what else you can say about it. There were studies done at the National Security Council under the Clinton administration um, where they sifted every possible bit of information and came up with nothing. Daniel Benjamin, who was on the NSC at that time, told me on the record that they had studied the question of ties between uh, Iraq and al-Qaeda and came up with zero. Also, there'd been no uh, terrorism from Iraq or by Iraq that was on the record for, as far as I know, going back to the first Gulf War. I don't think from 1990 onwards there was a single incidence of Iraq being linked or sponsoring uh, even a minor terrorism act, even you know somebody pulling out a gun and shooting someone in Beirut. Um, there are lots of those linked to many other countries um, but none linked to Iraq in, in the last 14 years. So if Iraq was such a terrorist mastermind, why weren't they masterminding anything? Well, these are basic questions that nobody was asking. And if you look at people on the right, people like Stephen Hayes or uh, Cliff May, they'll, they'll say stuff like, well, what about Abu al-Mas? Uh, Iraq was uh, providing refuge for him, or Abu Nadal, you know, all these... You know, they list all these incidents where terrorists had some sort of tangential connection. You know, can you speak to any of these uh, specifics? Well, all I know is that all of the experts said that Iraq was not behind terrorism in the last 14 years. Uh, whatever the right-wing lunatics want to say, I, I, I'm not going to address it. I mean, they're wrong and I'm right. 
um, they, they have to show proof that something happened. Abu Nidal was a terrorist in the 1970s. And he, when, by the time he got to Baghdad recently, he was a decrepit, sick old guy in a house somewhere who was just living in Baghdad and wasn't connected to anything. Um, I mean, that, that, the fact that, you know, how do I say, there's an overlap between the resistance among the Palestinians and terrorism. And some Palestinians are terrorists. Um, and some terrorists are Palestinians. And so it's easy to take the word terrorism and mush it up and then somehow connect it to all the Arab countries because basically all the Arab countries support the PLO. So if, if you're going to make those kind of connections to the left wing or the radical wing of the Palestinian movement and find some connection to some Arab countries, anybody can do that. But we're talking about specific organizations and specific terrorist actions. And if you minus out uh, the resistance fighting in the occupied territories in Palestine, there's simply no Iraqi terrorism um, to speak of at all. Yes, Saddam provided some support to suicide bombers' families in Palestine, but that's not unique in the Arab world, and that has a, a kind of a generic general support among many Arab countries who consider that a war. Um, you can argue that that's a dumb strategy. I would. I don't support suicide bombing, but it's not the same as supporting Al-Qaeda. It's not the same as supporting Islamic terrorism, and in fact, the, the Islamists considered Saddam to be one of their worst enemies. So what you're saying is that other Arab countries also give money to families, or is it just Iraq? Many, many Arab countries do, of course. Um, there's, there, there, there are a lot of Arab countries that support uh, the Palestinian movement in all the shapes and forms and formats, through charities, through money directly to the PLO, through um, Hezbollah. I mean, there's a lot of money that funnels in to the Palestinian movement from many Arab countries, from Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries, to Syria, to Iraq, to Egypt, to Libya. I mean, there's a, obviously a lot of this money goes into supporting the Palestine-Israeli conflict. Um, I don't think that has anything to do with Osama bin Laden, who's never been much concerned with the Palestine issue during his, uh, his career. He's a jihadist who who's concerned about establishing a, a, a caliphate and reestablishing a uh, central nervous system for the Islamic movement and, and then conquering the West for Islam or some deluded plan that he has. I don't know what it is. Um, but whatever it is, it's nothing to do with the Palestinians. If you take a step back and, and look at a, a principle of, of investigative journalism of, of follow the money, if you follow the money in case of Iraq, what do you find? And, and, and speak to, you know, to the motivations as to why. It, it, in other words... What, if, what money are we talking about? If you would have looked at uh, why... The, for, let me take a, and ask this. Why did the United States go to war in Iraq? From your... That's a different, that's a different question, oh, but then I'll okay. follow up. The United States went to war in Iraq for reasons that had nothing to do with terrorism or weapons of mass destruction. It had everything to do with global strategy. They wanted to demonstrate American might, first of all, to show that America was, now that the Cold War is over, the pre preeminent power in the world, and to show everybody from Europe to the Arabs to the Russians to the Chinese that we're going to throw our muscle around. These are people who promoted the war are people who think that American military might is the key to projecting American democracy overseas. Second, there are two other issues, oil and Israel. Uh, nobody can believe that we didn't have oil on our mind when we were invading and occupying the country that has the second largest oil reserves in the world. And third, by eliminating Saddam, we cleared. That's over. Okay, start at third. Third, by eliminating Saddam, we cleared the Middle East out uh, 
of a major strategic opponent of the Israelis. The Israelis must have loved the fact that we expended hundreds of billions of dollars and hundreds of American lives, not to mention uh, dead Iraqis, to eliminate Saddam because he was one of the main bulwarks of the Arab world opposition to Israel. So now that we've done that, Israel has a free hand or a much freer hand in dealing with the other Arab countries and the Palestinians. So for all those reasons, I think, um, going into Iraq was nothing to do with terrorism or the stated reasons of the Bush administration. In fact, the people who'd been arguing uh, for invading Iraq had been doing it for many years, long before 9-11. And their arguments didn't change only the president's rationale for accepting those arguments. The president's feeble mind was captured after 9-11 by the neoconservatives who told him that uh, he could you know, rebuild his presidency by becoming a war president and fighting a global war on terrorism. And they gave him the map of how to do that. First Afghanistan, then Iraq, and then Syria and Iran, and after that maybe the Gulf states but we're going to fight this war globally and it's going to rescue your presidency, which had been pretty much collapsing by August of 2001. So the president got on board for his own political reasons. Um, I don't think he knows the difference between Iraq and Iran. And, and the real supporters of the war had much deeper strategic reasons for planning the, the conflict in the first place. And and so when you, you look at the press performance, it seemed like they weren't really asking that why uh, question. Or if they were, it, they were just taking boilerplate answers from the government and not digging deeper. Uh, can you speak to that? And what, what could have they, how could they have changed their paradigm to dig into why we're actually going to war? Well, you know, even today, a year after the war, nobody's asking the question why we went to war. I mean, they're asking the question, why couldn't we find the WMD? And they're asking the question, how come there's no connections to terrorism? But still no one's asking, why did we fight this war in the first place? They, they say, oh yes, there were a bunch of hardliners, they call them, who wanted to go to war even from the first days of the Bush administration. That's in Richard Clark's book. It's in many other books. Paul O'Neill talks about it in his book. Okay, we know they were all yapping about this a year before 9-11 and more. But no one's asking why. I mean, I, th I find that amazing even today, that no one is saying, uh, why did you want to go to war against Iraq? Why single out Iraq as the most dangerous place in the world where the United States has to launch a, a unilateral pre preemptive war? Remember, this was before 9-11 that they were arguing this. And so uh, I think that the same failure that we can identify before the war we can still identify, and I'll bet the history books don't go into it. Um, it's just one of those things that uh, will be treated as a political question of these people were for the war, these people were against the war, the UN had this position, the Europeans had that position, and this is, how, this is who won the big struggle and we went to war. But the answer to the question why isn't, isn't going to come out unless... Um, you know, things change pretty drastically about the way people think about history. And so, it, it, from all the journalists that I've talked to, they, they give me that same reason because of the neocons or because, you know, because he could or, uh, you know, th there seems to be this uh, just taking things at, at face value. Do you see that it's the economics of the situation, the, the media, the way it's structured or, you know, why is it the hard, that hard to cover complex ideas? I, if you're asking the why didn't we ask why, I don't know. That's too complex for me to figure out. I think there's a hundred different reasons. I mean, um, they should have done it and they didn't. That's what I'm concerned about. Now, um, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. I'm not sure I can answer that question. It's, it's um, a mystery. Um, Journalists should ask questions that unsettle people, and in this case, they didn't. Um, they they went along with the the, the you know conventional wisdom, um, and I'm 
I'm disgusted by it. And when I spoke to uh, Jim Loeb, he said that actual producers from you know one of the nightly news magazines that there's 60 Minutes Night One, he didn't specify, but he said that they came to him and said, let's do a, a, a whole segment on this new conservative movement and their ties to why we're going to war. And it was passed up and it was killed. And so can you speak to, like, the issue of Israel seems to be this really taboo subject as to be having anything to do with Iran. Well, Israel is a very hot topic politically because the Democrats are unwilling to confront the Israeli question and the Republicans because of the Christian conservatives, the evangelicals who are so-called Christian Zionists are completely now in bed with Sharon and company. So the two big parties uh, in the United States are completely in bed with the pro-Israeli perspective. Um, and that makes it, I think, uh, an extremely difficult question to raise because as soon as you do raise it, then you're accused of anti-Semitism. And the neoconservatives are very good at that, at saying, um, oh, anybody who calls us a conspiracy or a cabal, that's like the Nazis calling the Jews a cabal, or I don't know, I mean, they bring up these historical references and pretty soon you're supporting the Holocaust or something. I, I, don't, I don't think that they have the courage to face their own convictions. Most of the neoconservatives, including the non-Jewish ones, like Gene Kirkpatrick and Jim Woolsey and Newt Gingrich, are fanatical supporters of Israel, and they have to defend that uh, in the public discourse. Um, I think there is an extreme unwillingness to uh, identify Israel as one of the problems that the United States has in the Middle East. It was clear in Michael Moore's movie, Fahrenheit 9-11, where he had no problem showing Bush and Cheney and other Republicans chumming it up with Saudi officials in their robes and their mustaches and, and nefarious looking scowls and greedy looking smiles on their faces. It was a fairly racist portrayal, as far as I'm concerned, that Moore did. Um, never once did he mention Israel in his movie. And in fact, the Saudis were against the war in Iraq. They tried to stop the United States from going to war in Iraq. And so if Bush was so in the Saudi pocket, why did he go to war? That makes no sense, does it? But in Moore's movie and in the general public perception, I think, um, Bush equals oil equals Saudi Arabia, and therefore he went to war. Well, that's completely wrong. The, most of the Arabs, and in fact most of the oil companies, were against attacking Iraq because they were pretty happy with the status quo of dealing with the Gulf states and having good relations with Saudi Arabia and even being able to buy oil from Iraq, which after all produces it and sells it. It doesn't, you know, dump it into the, the Persian Gulf. Um, so the oil interests, the oil industry and the Saudis were all uniformly against the war with Iraq. And even some of the Republicans who are most closely connected to the oil industry um, and like Brent Scowcroft or Jim Baker or Larry Eagleburger were also all against the war and spoke out in 2002 and 2003 against the war. And those are the people who are denouncing the neocons in the Republican Party. Um, so my argument is that um, if Saudi Arabia was against the war and Israel was supporting it, you know, who, who won? It wasn't the Saudis. And when you earlier said it, it, it is about oil, and then you say at the same time it's not, so can you make the distinction when you say it's about oil, uh, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, the war in Iraq was about oil, but it wasn't about the oil companies, and it wasn't about Saudi Arabia. The, the issue of oil in Iraq was a strategic question. Whoever controls the Persian Gulf is going to control the next hundred years of world history because every country in the world uh, from China and Japan to the Europeans to all the developing countries like India, not to mention the Americas, are going to become increasingly dependent over the next 30, 40 years on two countries, Saudi Arabia and Iraq. Those are the only two countries that have sufficient oil reserves to be able to double and triple and quadruple their production. And everybody else, the North Sea, Alaska, uh, 
Venezuela, parts of Africa are running out of oil. The production is declining and there's no more to be found uh, or little to be found. So Saudi Arabia and Iraq, as important as they are now, are going to be 10 times more important in 20 years. So by controlling Iraq, we already control the rest of the Gulf countries. Uh, we virtually occupy Kuwait now. We have our main headquarters in Qatar. We, we control Saudi Arabia by default, basically, with um, having surrounded it and, and making, propping up the, the royal family there. Uh, and now we own Iraq. So now we control all of the sources of oil for the world for the next 50 years. And that's going to be a, a major factor in the strategic development of future world history. And if people on the right heard you say we own Iraq, they would say, no, they don't. It's a free country now. They're, you know, what, on what basis do you say that we own Iraq? Well, we, we own Iraq. We're occupying it with 140,000 troops. We're not letting in uh, anybody else where we can to get business contracts. The entire Iraqi government was currently is appointed by the United States. A number of them, including the prime minister, were CIA agents for 20 years. Um, I mean, the, it's, it's a, I call it Iraqistan. I mean, it's a quizzling government of CIA stooges and tribal sheikhs and, and other corrupt individuals. Just because Shalabi isn't part of it doesn't mean the rest of them aren't, aren't corrupt as well. And what eventually, now what eventually emerges in Iraq, I mean, it's a country that's catastrophically plagued by violence. It's on the brink of civil war. There's no order. Major cities are under the control of privately owned militias. The Kurds control their little fiefdom. The Shiites control the south. In the center of Iraq, most of the cities from Fallujah to Ramadi to Samarra are being controlled by various coalitions of resistance groups. And the Iraqi government, so-called government, controls a few neighborhoods of Baghdad. It's just like Afghanistan, where Karzai, this well-dressed stooge we put in power there, controls Kabul, and the entire rest of the country is controlled by pro-Al-Qaeda militia and, and warlords and tribal leaders and so forth. There's, there's no Afghan government to speak of, and now there's no Iraqi government to speak of. Um, it's, it's more likely that Iraq will break up into pieces than it will have anything resembling a government next year. And if we go back to uh, Israel and look at the media's treatment of Israel, do they not cover Israel uh, as, a, you know, as part of Iraq because either uh, the Democrats and Republicans agree, or because uh, they would receive too much flack, or it's too much of a hot, you know, can you speak to some of the reasons why you think the media doesn't? I, I think the media is just afraid to um, get accused of anti-Semitism, so they ignore the Israeli question. I mean, the fact that all of the leading um, advocates of, well, I shouldn't say all, but I mean, many of the leading advocates, I should start that again, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, the fact that many of the leading advocates of war on Iraq signed documents and papers and advisory uh, position papers to the Israeli government in the 1990s um, went on record saying that they were basically working as advisors to the Israelis. That Doug Feith and his law firm um, have offices in Israel. They're extremely close to the right-wing Zionists. They're extremely close to Ariel Sharon. Um, I mean, this is known information, and it certainly needs to be put into the, the debate about why did we go to war? What, was there an ulterior objective among some of these people to eliminate one of Israel's main opponents? And I think the answer is clearly yes. But um, that's, you know, treated as if it's an illegitimate subject to raise. Um, and that's why... Um, I think the media is afraid to go into this because as soon as you start to raise the Israeli question, the neoconservatives start uh, attacking you as anti-Semitic. Uh, 
last uh, last uh, second. I, as soon as you start attacking the neoconservatives, um, then they start accusing you of being anti-Semitic, and you know the the whole Israeli question is very complex. There are a lot of Israelis who didn't see Iraq as a major threat. Um, there are a lot of moderate Israelis and people in the Israeli army who think that the main threat to Israel came from Iran and Hamas and the, the fundamentalist movement and thought that Saddam was contained. So even in Israel, there was a, there was a debate. But the current Israeli leadership around Sharon um, was uh, militantly in favor of the Iraq crusade. And I think um, even in Israel, there's a more robust debate than there is here because at least the Israelis who criticize Sharon can't be accused of anti-Semitism. Uh, here it's, it's considered, you know, um, bad form to attack Sharon. I mean, this is, Ariel Sharon is a man whose career 50 years ago started as a terrorist. He was the commander of a thing called Brigade 101, which in 1953-54 conducted terrorist raids against Palestinians. In one case, they attacked a village and massacred something like 60 or 70 men, women, and children uh, in broad daylight uh, as a deliberate Israeli terrorist attack. This is when Israel was a state now, not during the, the 1948 war. And Sharon was the commander of that uh, Brigade 101. He, he's a thug. Uh, he worked with Palestinian Nazis. Not, I'm sorry, he, sorry. He, he's a thug. He worked with Lebanese Nazis, the Falangist movement, to massacre Palestinians in refugee camps in Beirut during the 1982 war, when he gave the green light for the uh, massacre of those um, hundreds and hundreds of Palestinians by these um, bloodthirsty phalangist uh, warlords who swept down on those camps uh, while they were allied to the Israeli forces occupying Lebanon. Um, so this is not a man who 20 years ago even Israelis would have been shocked if you'd said that he was going to become prime minister. It would be like, um, I don't know, if some you know, member of the American Nazi party were to become president of the United States, people would be shocked. I mean, Sharon was considered anathema by a vast majority of the Israelis. Um, but the battering of Israel by terrorism has driven Israelis to reach out for a strong man, and they voted for Sharon. And that's what they've got now, somebody who's, you know, uh, doesn't hesitate to send jets and tanks and helicopters against refugee camps. And when we talked to uh, John H. Brown, you know, who uh, retired from the State Department leading up to the war in Iraq, he's a foreign service officer. You know, his, his point was don't count out the chaos of government. He doesn't believe in a grand strategy, that there was a grand strategy to, to this. Can you speak to you know, kind of the, the bureaucracy of, of trying to implement like a huge strategy to, to go to war in Iraq and, and where you stand on that? Well, I don't think it's a question of a grand strategy or a conspiracy. There were a lot of constituencies who supported the war in Iraq, and they all did it for their own reasons. Some of them were the arms control people who felt like we have to go to war because uh, Saddam is a major violator of the proliferation rules, and so we've got to put a stop to that. And then there were the anti-terrorism people, who, many of whom uh, were recruited to support the war because they believed wrongly that Saddam was a supporter of, of terrorism. And then there were the, the, the neoconservative, you know, sort of militarists who felt like we had to go to war to demonstrate our, our muscle and might and, and to plant the flag for the new American empire, the, the project for a new American century people. And then there were people who wanted to go to war because uh, Saddam was a major supporter of the Palestinians and had an army that could, could uh, threaten Israel. I mean, there were many factions that sort of came together and rallied around the president, or he wouldn't have been able to pull the war off. Any, any war has many people who support it for many reasons. Um, 
I think, though, you have to look at the underlying, underlying organizing force behind the war. Um, and that's the people who consistently from the early 1990s until 2003 were hammering away at the need for invading Iraq. And that's why I'm focusing on the neoconservatives. And, okay. Okay. And uh, when you, uh, you know, speak to you know, going to the American Enterprise Institute and kind of your uh, immersing yourself around the neoconservative thoughts and some, some of your insights maybe. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not sure how, what you're asking. I, um, uh, well, I mean, I guess when, uh, from your, have you gained any you know, <coughs> insights beyond the planning documents? Or, you know, the difference between a lot of people outside of D.C. is they, they just read the stuff on the Internet. And when you read stuff on the Internet, what kind of, like, nuggets or insights did you read that, you know, did you see this war as being inevitable at any, any, at any point? Or, well, I, I said to my friends that the day Bush was elected, when the Supreme Court finally ruled that he was the president, that we were going to go to war in Iraq. Um, I mean, I thought it was inevitable from December of 2000, um, because uh, I was convinced that the combination of the neoconservatives who wanted the war and a president who wanted to avenge his father's bungling of the first war. Um, and as the president said, this was a guy that tried to kill my daddy, uh, even though, by the way, Seymour Hirsch proved in The New Yorker that there was no Iraqi plot to kill the first President Bush. That was another myth that's been recycled a thousand times by this administration. Um, that terrorist plot didn't exist. Anyway, um, I was convinced from the beginning that this war was not inevitable in that it couldn't be stopped, but that it was inexorable in the sense that the, the, the Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld team was going to push for it and was probably powerful enough to, to get it. And when I started following the neoconservatives and going to the American Enterprise Institute and reading their magazines and interviewing them and talking to them, um, I guess what I was really struck by is how fraternal they are, that if you're part of their circle, then you're on their team. And if you're not part of their circle, then they regard you with deep and abiding suspicion. suspicion. Uh, and that's not just true of people who are, you know, determined to criticize them, but even people who are not allies. It's like you're with us or against this kind of thing. And so the American Enterprise Institute with... Um, people like Richard Pearl and Newt Gingrich and, and Jean Kirkpatrick um, became kind of the, the command central, I, I call it the, the uh, other CENTCOM for the war, because they uh, staffed the administration, sent key people into it, brought the key people out there to speak, you know, organized the papers, the research papers, the position papers. Um, you know, sort of drummed up the support and were far more important than any other uh, think tank or, or um, organizing force. And when you look at what we're at now as, you know, America and fighting this war on terrorism, what, what is your vision of what we need to do to achieve world peace from this point? Well, I'm, I'm a contrarian on the war on terrorism. I don't believe there's a great terrorist threat out there. I mean, I make the argument that the same people who told us there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq are exactly the same people who are telling us now that al-Qaeda is about to strike us. I think the president is deliberately lying about the terrorist threat just the way he lied about the WMD. Um, yes, there are terrorists who want to hurt us, but... Do we need a global war on terrorism? I think it's bunk. Um, think of it this way. If Al-Qaeda was so vast and powerful a, a force, why is it that in the two and a half years now since 9-11, not one American has even been punched in the face by an Al-Qaeda representative? Where are these Al-Qaeda people? John Ashcraft said after 9-11 that there were 5,000 Al-Qaeda sleepers in the United States. Where are they? 
All of the people detained after 9-11, not one was charged with uh, involvement in an Al-Qaeda plot of hundreds and hundreds of people who were picked up. They're, they're lying to us about this threat. It wouldn't take much for Al-Qaeda people um, to get a few machine guns and shoot up a few malls in the United States to cause chaos in this country for months and years. Why don't they do it? Where are they? I believe they don't exist. Yes, there are some terrorists who might want to blow up a building, or they might want to shoot some people, or they might want to hijack an airplane. We've been dealing with that for 30 years. So that's why we have police, that's why we have FBI, that's why we have courts. But we don't need to go around invading other countries and bombing uh, people and mobilizing billions of dollars and forming a Department of Homeland Security and everything else to fight a threat that small. And I believe it's very small. Okay. And let's see. Um, when people say, you know, it's all CIA's fault um, that, you know, this bad intelligence, how do you reply to, you know, it's all just the CIA's fault? Well, I think it's pretty obvious by now that the CIA gave Bush what he wanted to hear. And that's George Tenet's fault. Um, many of the people in the CIA didn't agree uh, with the idea either that Iraq had ties to terrorism or that Iraq had big stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction. Um, but from the lower reaches of the CIA, by the time it got up to the top and then through Tenet's hands, it became um, much more uh, in tune with what the president wanted to hear. So the president is trying to blame the CIA. And George Tenet, like a good boy, quit uh, and took the blame. But I don't buy it. OK, and when you look at, uh, they say there's no political pressure at all. You know, do you see the Office of Special Plans as a form of pressure? or? Have you heard of any, you know, repetitive tasking or other forms of uh, pressure applied to... Uh, well, I, I, wrote, I wrote lots of articles about how there was pressure on the intelligence agencies. I, I, I think, uh, I mean, it's the job of um, investigative reporters to go out and find out the truth. And I think there have been a lot of articles since the war that show that there were pressure on intelligence agencies, that Cheney went over to the CIA repeatedly and made it clear what he wanted to hear. And uh, Rumsfeld created his own little mini CIA at the Pentagon to challenge the CIA and, and come up with these radical and wrong conclusions about Iraq. And the president gave speeches um, which were broadcast on television saying what he wanted to hear. So it, to say that there was no pressure on the CIA is silly beyond belief. And lots of people have said to me and other reporters, that there was lots of pressure. Now, when they get called to it by a congressional committee and they say, were you pressured particularly, they, they say, no, that, doesn't, that means that Dick Cheney didn't go down to the basement of the CIA and start you know, um, uh, pressuring individual analysts. But from the top and through the network and through his people and through the chain of command, that's exactly what happened. And, and it's not the first time it's ever happened with the CIA. It's just the first time we ever went to war because of it. Okay. And let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, let's um, sit for like 10 seconds in silence so I can get some room to home and just like see if there's anything else. Sure. I guess one thing, if you, if you look at the amount of uh, foreign policy aid that we give to Israel. Why do we give Israel so much money? Well, I don't know. That's another no. question. We give lots of money to Israel. We give <clears throat> a lot of money to Egypt. I mean, we have a big interest in the Middle East. We have interest in the Middle East because there's a lot of oil there. Okay. It's not complicated. <clears throat> and when you look back to, uh, you know, the, you mentioned in one of your articles the Carter Doctrine to... Uh, to basically identify this region as our, our national interest. Can you just like speak to that briefly? For 
for something like 50 years, the United States has gradually encroached on the Persian Gulf and it can be easily documented in terms of uh, alliances, first like NATO and CENTO, individual treaties with the countries over there, vast military support, not only to Saudi Arabia, to, but to many other countries uh, that were the oil producing nations, building up bases, building up a navy, building up a doctrine. Um, <clears throat> beginning in the 1970s, it became much more explicit in the 1980s, even more explicit with the first Gulf War. We had an on-the-ground presence there in many of the countries. And now, uh, it's like the Persian Gulf is an extension of the U.S. military. So there's a, a secular trend here of American occupation of the Gulf. Not a new thing. There's been talk about that for decades. Um, and I believe that in 20 years, um, it will even be more explicit that we're not going to, if, if, if you know, the current trends continue, the United States is not going to let the Persian Gulf be an independent place because it's just too important.